Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. As Pastor Zach has mentioned, we're going to be walking through two verses today, covering some ground, thinking about what it means to do your job. When it comes to the church, uh, there's a lot of ideas on how churches should be run or what the, the content of a pastor's activity should be. Uh, I could liken it to, to uh, building a roller coaster. Some people think a, a loop-de-loop goes good there, and other people think a, a corkscrew turn goes well there, and let's make the first hill this big. But it's really not like that. Uh, it's not as if uh, pastors are trying to make up what they're supposed to do. They might try to figure out how to apply it, but they're not trying to pioneer it. And today we're going to see a, a job description for a pastor. And I know what you're saying. Well, I'm here and you're there. I'm not a pastor. Well, one of the things about this is you're going to see that this isn't something unusual reserved just for, as would be called, the clergy. These qualities, these characteristics that Paul is going to deal out to Timothy are things that we traffic in all the time. It just so happens that when it comes to a pastor, he needs to do other things, but he cannot let these things go. These things are the must things you must do. And so when it comes to, to you as someone in the church, please don't push back from this text. Embrace it and say, how do I walk in these truths? How do I function? How do I see these values in my life? Because just as they're important in the body of Christ, they're important in the life of your family, in your life, your relationships. This week I was reading a story about a little boy, his name was Johnny, uh, about eight years old, and he had come to the point in his life, for some reason, he thought he was a pastor. And so what he would do is he would hold church. He would do this in his room, he would do it in the backyard, and one day his mom heard him holding church, as she called it, and she heard him out the window. And it just so happens that they had some, some cats had given birth, and so there were some kittens lined up, and the kittens were his, his church, and he heard him, heard her preaching to these, these kittens. And, and the next thing you know, we heard these meows, and uh, she heard the meows, and she heard the scratching at the door. She leaned out the, the window and saw that he was dunking these kittens in the water. <laughs> and she said, don't do that, Johnny. You'll drown those cats. He said, they should have thought about that before they joined my church. <laughs> That's funny. I thought so. This side, not so much. But I thought it was cute. It's cute when a kid is doing it who's eight years old. It's not cute when a pastor is doing it when he's 40. Uh, when he doesn't understand what he's supposed to do and he's making things up and people are damaged in the way. People aren't kittens. Pastors aren't called to be immature like that. But what is a pastor to do? What is the job description? Because knowing what you're supposed to do is critical and be successful in what you do. Matter of fact, when I was a, a kid, 16 years old, my first job was at a, a local restaurant. I won't tell you the name because in this day of litigation, I don't want to be sued. But I showed up for work. They gave me a hat. They gave me an apron. And the next thing I knew, I was shoving hamburgers into a machine that was just churning out hamburgers. And I thought, this isn't so bad. I could do this for a while. And it just so happens that I was scheduled on the times in which there were buses coming through. And so for the lion's share of my shift, I was just shoving hamburgers into the back of this machine. And at the end of the night, I would change out the fryer vat. And I thought, well, this isn't so bad. They didn't teach me anything else about that job. And about two weeks in, I was sitting in history class. And a girl by the name of Stephanie came in who was a coworker with me at that, at that job. And she said, Dan, hey, um, have you ever thought about getting a different job? And I said, why would I get a different job? I've got this job. And she said, well, um, you might want to think about getting a different job. And reading between the lines, I said to Stephanie, do they not think I'm doing a good job? And she went, well, and I said, are they going to fire me? And she said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, I distinctly remember this. 
they have never showed me what I'm supposed to do. Like all I know is I show up and I shove hamburgers into the back of this machine. She says, well, you're not picking it up fast enough. I'm picking what up fast enough. Well, you've got to go over and actually make the hamburgers. I was like, well, no one ever told me that. And so being the person I am, I didn't quit. I made them fire me. And my last interview with them was, you never told me what to do. And the manager said, you're right. We're sorry about that. And I remember thinking, that is so crazy. And you know what is even crazier? Is that when a church doesn't know what it's supposed to do, when a pastor is just shoving along programs and not understanding how he is supposed to relate to his people, not understanding how he is related to God, not understanding what the body is supposed to be about. What are the dynamics? What does he focus on? What is motivating him? And what are the things that he's going to have to do, whether he wants to or not? And in this passage today, you're going to find that Paul, who is in a jail cell, who is in a rock, in the, a hole in the ground, if you remember the start of the book, he is in prison. He knows his time is coming short. These are the last words that Paul is going to write Timothy. This is the last chapter ever. And he is zeroing in. He's given him lots of incredible truths. Hey, do this. Don't do this. Think this. Don't think this. Watch out for this. Encourage that. And in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he starts getting into zeroing in on Timothy. Whatever you do. Be motivated by this. In other words, remember this. And then I want you to remember in your motivation, there's five things that you have to do as a pastor. You may not want to do them. You might not be good at them. But you must do these five specific things. And today, Grace Fellowship, these motivations are your motivations. These truths, these five points are yours. You're going to find in your life, if you're healthy, that you'll be motivated in the same category Timothy's to be motivated. And you'll find that you'll be working within these five commands that Paul gives to Timothy. You may not be a pastor, but you are definitely called to be in ministry. And so therefore, all followers of Jesus Christ need to pay attention to this. So let's look at the first thing. Verse 1, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. And let's read both those verses. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And as I've said, this isn't just for pastors. Matter of fact, if you would notice, even in the description, in, for, in Titus chapter 1, 7 through 9, and 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, when you look at the characteristics of what a, a pastor needs to have in his quality of character, they're not things that are unique from every other believer. Matter of fact, these are things that believers are supposed to be known for. Things like not being quarrelsome, not a lover of money, being self-controlled, being respectable. It would never be thought of that, okay, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't have to be respectable. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the ministry. I can love money. It's not that at all. The idea is that a pastor in his quality of character needs to come to a place of maturity in which he understands the value of money and he makes it subordinate to loving Christ more. He understands when it comes to being respectable by people that are outside the church, that really matters. Because if people see him badly and he's not respectable, that limits the gospel. And so just because it mentions that uniquely about pastors doesn't mean all of us aren't in that same category. All believers are. And just as we talk about this today, what we are supposed to remember, verse 1, that's our motivation. What you must remember, Timothy, 
Your motivation needs to be about this. In verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. That word charge you has the idea of get your attention. A solemn, a, a respectable, a reverential mission you are on. This matters, Timothy. This is the third time that Paul has said this. In First and Second Timothy, this is the third time that he specifically says, I charge you. It's meant to get his attention, to go, listen, pay attention. You can get a lot of things wrong, but you can't get wrong what I'm about to tell you. It's the idea of a babysitter uh, getting instructions from a parent as the parents are leaving, going out the door. Remember this, don't do this, do this. They go to bed at this time. For heaven's sake, here are the emergency numbers. This is how to get a hold of me. It's the instructions before the SAT, the ACT. Now remember this, do this, pay attention to this. It's the idea of a parent giving a, a driver's test. This is the gas, this is the brake. Don't get them mixed up. I remember my sister, we got a go-kart when I was young. I went over and over and over. This is the gas. This is the brake. This is the gas. This is the brake. She proceeded to drive the go-kart into the side of the house because she missed that instruction. We went over and over. That's the idea of I charge you. It's the idea of the court of law. When somebody goes up and they're getting ready to give a witness, they put their hand on the Bible, swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They're always supposed to tell the truth. But in this moment, it takes on a different flavor. This is a big deal. There's someone's life is on the line based on the testimony you are about to give. So the court says, let's pause. Let's make sure you understand. Let's make sure you're charged with the understanding of what the gravity of this moment is, and that's the same idea here. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Now, why does he say that? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Why wouldn't he go all the way and say in the Holy Spirit? Why wouldn't he say in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and his church? Why wouldn't he say in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit and his church and everybody you know? Why does he pick this formula? I think he picks this because, again, that idea of the solemnness of the moment is echoed in that phrase because in Deuteronomy 17, 6, and 7, the Jewish people who have understood when there is a dispute or need for clarification Two witnesses need to be present. Because if somebody says, well, they did this to me, or they ripped me off, or we agreed to this business truth or this business principle, and I was supposed to get this, and they gave me that, they would call, okay, who was the witness to this agreement? Who was a witness to your conversation? They would call them together. And it says on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one is to die shall be put to death, and the person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. When it came to the point someone who violated the law of Israel, he says, listen, one person is not enough. You have to have two who are aware of the circumstance, who are intimately involved with the details. Matter of fact, uh, this is the reason why you remember the story in John 8 with the woman who's caught in adultery. And she is brought before Jesus, and Jesus does not condemn her actions. Some people see that and go, see, Jesus lets people go. Jesus isn't into judging people. He could have judged her in that moment, but he refuses to. Jesus is more about love now than, than the God of the Old Testament. I've heard that. Have you ever heard someone say that? So actually, Jesus was applying this passage perfectly. Because the witnesses are supposed to be sincere. And when the woman is brought before Jesus Christ, who isn't there? The guy. So this isn't about God's law. This is not about righteousness. This is about trying to nail Jesus to the wall. And who is going to be the witness to this? Who is going to come forward? 
you who are without sin, cast the first stone. Jesus says that because they were sinful in their motivations. There weren't two witnesses. They had just gotten this woman. They had forgotten the guy, left him alone. And so Jesus perfectly applies this concept in that moment. And so therefore, he does what he can do and says, go and sin no more. He cannot judge her because the witnesses aren't there. And I think that's the same force in this passage. But the difference is this. Notice who the witnesses are. God and Christ Jesus. Now, this is going to bring a soberness to Timothy's mind. Paul wants Timothy to know. What you do in ministry matters so much. I want you to understand it's not about the people in your care. It's about the God who sees. God watches you. God is paying attention to the details, Timothy. Let that be your motivation because you've been accepted on the basis of what Christ has done. But never forget, when the lights are off and no one else is in the room, God is paying attention. Let that be your motivation. You must be motivated by that. And by the way, who is the judge of the living and the dead? Now, why does he say that? You're finding out that when I read a passage, I ask a lot of questions. That first with the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's the judge of the living and the dead. Why does he say that? Why can't he just say the living? Why does he go out of his way and say the dead? I think Paul's point is that no one escapes the view of God. It doesn't matter if you're living, doesn't matter if you're dead. God judges everyone. No one slips out the back door, Timothy. And you as a pastor, you can't think that in some ways that you'll slip off God's radar screen. He's watching. He's paying attention. I charge you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, he's going to judge the living and the dead. You can feel the weight sitting on Timothy, can't you? You You can feel that. And I think it would be crushing if he didn't realize he'd already been accepted by God in Christ. Matter of fact, this idea of Timothy needing to be faithful and discharging the duties of of a pastor was something that Paul had felt. Paul had felt it very specifically. Matter of fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you... He says to the people, the church at Thessalonica, my work, the thing that I have done, the thing I've poured my life into is you. And when I stand before God, I'm going to be boasting in what the Lord has done in me to you. We often don't think about this. You see, unbelievers, people that are are lost, have never trusted in Christ they're going to face what is called the great white throne judgment. If you want to read about it, the idea is in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. That everybody will be resurrected to a judgment. And the people that are lost, have never trusted in Christ, are going to stand before God in their own righteousness, which is no righteousness. And on the basis of that, they'll be separated and thrown into the lake of fire. But thank the Lord, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus has paid your sin debt. Isn't that incredible? So that you don't face that. So but you face what's called the Bema seat judgment. What that means is simply this. It's the idea in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 through 10, to give an account of your service to Christ and for Christ. It's not judging you based on your own righteousness but judging what you've done with the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the the opportunities. What have you done with your life? And Paul in that passage says, I'm going to stand in church at Thessalonica. I'm going to be so thankful because I've poured into you and I see Christ in you. And that raises my hope. That raises my hope before the Lord. Revelation 22, 12 and 13 says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me 
to repay each one for what he has done. Do you know that the opportunities you have, the relationships you make, the resources that have been given to you will be measured by Christ, not for you to get into heaven, but for you as a servant of Christ to find your joy in what you have done on earth. This isn't work salvation. We're accepted because of what Christ has done for us. But this is the idea of what am I doing with my life? What am I doing because God and Jesus are watching? He judges the living and the dead. And that last part there is judging the living of the dead. And when exactly will that happen? Well, that'll happen at his appearing, at his coming. As it says in that passage, the idea of and by his appearing and his kingdom. That's the deadline. Time's up. Timothy, you need to know, you've got a time in which you're working at the church of Ephesus. You're supposed to functionally do these things. Be motivated. Remember that God watches. And what you do matters. And when will that time be up? When Jesus Christ appears. When Jesus Christ comes back. When his kingdom is set up. And his kingdom is coming. That is supposed to be this motivation for Timothy. What about you? Does that motivate you? I've found in my own life that when I'm not consciously aware that God is with me, God is watching, and it matters what I do, there are no idle moments that it matters, I find that I'm more productive. Relationships in my life are more focused. My, my mind is more trained. It reminds me of when I was in eighth grade playing basketball. I remember I was playing basketball, we were warming up, and a a girl came into the arena, a girl who was very pretty. And I remember I had the best game of my life. Scored 26 points. My coach came up later and said, what was the difference? Like, well, I've never seen you shoot like that. I've never seen that kind of defense. And I didn't say it was because the girl in the fourth row, but it was <laughs> because she was watching. And it made all the difference in the world. And I think for Paul, it made all the difference. And for Timothy, it makes all the difference. Be aware, I charge you, presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom when it comes. That's his motivation. Is that yours? Is that something you're aware of? When you're driving to work on Monday morning, when you're grocery shopping, you're being watched, not as kind of a creepy person looking over your shoulder, but a loving heavenly father who says, I'd love to use you to reach that person. I'd love to pour into you an understanding of who I am and the grace and the mercy that you've received. Just pay attention. Just pay attention and I'll do that and your life will be fruitful in a way that you could have never imagined. So I think that's the point, what he's supposed to remember. Next, verse number two, what you need to do. In other words, what you, Timothy, need to do, and by us, by extension, what we need to do, pastors, absolutely, all Christians generally. And he gave five specific things here. Uh, these are five imperatives. So uh, the force of that is this. These aren't uh, you're supposed to do this when you feel like it. These aren't things you're supposed to do if you think it's a good idea, uh, if everybody in the room agrees with it. These are five things, these are five imperatives that pastors will live in and that all of us will traffic in. The first one is this, it's, it's pretty obvious. It says, preach the word. Now, this is what I don't want you to have. Uh, I don't want you to have a, be a picture of simply what I'm doing now. While that is true, preaching the word is this. Uh, preaching the word happens in hallways. Preaching the word happens in parking lots. Happens in cubicles. It happens in lunchrooms. Uh, don't let it just stay on this stage because you'll drain the significance of it. Preach is the idea of herald. It's the idea of in the olden days where somebody would find out what the, the governor or the emperor in the Roman Empire would want uh, a specific edict to be read. 
the herald would go into an area in the center of the city where there was a lot of traffic and there was very often actually a, a stone kind of platform. It was reserved for the herald, uh, knowing that they certainly didn't have the internet, didn't have a newspaper. Where are you going to find your news? Well, we're going to wait for so-and-so to come up and stand on this thing and he'll say, by order of the emperor or by the ruler so-and-so. And then he would give out details. He would give out details of maybe new taxes that were coming or a new law that was made or a new warning for something or how the army was doing in a distant land. And people would find their information from the herald or the preacher. And so the idea is this, that he would come and he would ex express what the government wanted them to know, express what the emperor know they needed to know to be a good citizen. And so effectively, what a preacher is today is somebody who is sent with the truth of God to the people. In other words, just like you need to know what God says, that's what we're doing. Just as a Herod would represent the emperor, represent the governmental official, if you want to know what they're thinking, the herald would be that intermediary. Same thing with a pastor. On this moment, we are walking through scripture. You're finding out what God wants you to know during this time. And you can check it to make sure that I'm being accurate with the word. Same thing for you in the cubicle, in the lunchroom, in the hallway. You are to preach. Don't have a picture of a guy screaming at people. That's not the idea. You're simply telling people what God wants them to know about himself, about life, about relationships. You're simply unpacking for people who've got no access. They don't have any understanding of who God is or, or what life's to be about or what relationships are supposed to be like because this is what he says. And you are a preacher, as I am a preacher. Preach the word. Now that's interesting. You see, we often think the word is this, and it is. But back then, what would Timothy have thought the word was? Well, the word that we have in that specific passage is the word logos. And if you remember, the word in the New Testament for Jesus Christ, he is the word. John chapter 1, 1 through 8. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So that's the content. Heralding is the means, or preaching is mean, but the content, the, the scope of what our message is, is Jesus Christ. And as Jesus Christ is represented in the Word, in the, the Bible that we have, the Old Testament, Luke chapter 24, the road to Emmaus. Remember when Jesus Christ explained from the prophets, from the prophets of old, he explained who he was. What's the centerpiece of the Old Testament? It's Jesus Christ. It's forming this picture of this story of, of God going to be coming. And you see these pictures through these great kings who seem to, to love God and then they fail. And they love God and then they fail. They trust God and then they don't. You see the people of Israel who should just believe God and they don't. But then Jesus shows up. He's this incredible king who's got incredible power. He, he calms the storm, but he comes close to people in a way we would love for a king to come close. And he does things like heal people. He sets people free from demonic oppression. And every king in the Old Testament that you would say is, wow, he seems to be a great guy. And then, ah, uh, he failed. Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't fail. He absolutely delivers in all the ways that Israel, in the wilderness, all you have to do is believe. And they fail in a matter of days. Jesus doesn't. He totally succeeds. He goes to the wilderness 
And he absolutely trusts in every temptation the enemy throws at him. Why? Because Israel didn't. So he provides the way. He's the righteous savior. And so that's why John show up. He's a herald. He's a preacher. He came to show this, the word Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in John 1, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. The content of my message is here. I'm simply telling you. Now he's going to show you. He's the epitome. John the Baptist is the epitome of this absolutely. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14 through 17, we saw last week the sacred writings, all scripture is inspired by God. In other words, it unfolds who Jesus Christ is. Never forget, this word is not the thing in and of itself. It's how it makes much of Jesus Christ. It's not a mere academic book in which you learn it, it's that you learn about Christ and interact in this vibrancy of relationship. So he says to Timothy, listen, there's a lot of things you can do being a pastor. But what you must do is preach the word. Because you can have people say, well, listen, if we did this, wouldn't that make a great impact? Wouldn't we get into politics? Wouldn't that be great? Let's open hospitals and schools. Let's do this and do that. You go, wow, those are great ideas. But it is amazing that the first thing that Paul gives Timothy is this thing that you would think that it's not a lot of, it's not a fanfare in that. Just preach the word. And God loves to use the basic, consistent preaching of his word to call out a people for himself. Kind of reminds me of Jericho. You really want us to walk around a city every day and then the last day, seven times, and then that's how we get the victory. That's crazy. That's a terrible strategy. Well, it would be a terrible strategy if there wasn't a God who was going to empower it. Same thing with preaching the word. Timothy, just do this. God will take care of the rest. Remember, I charge you, the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. If he can do that, as you just faithfully execute the office, he'll take care of the rest. That's the first thing. Uh, preach the word. You've got to do that. The second thing is this, because of what if people don't want to hear? What if people go, well, uh, uh, that's a great message for you, but that's not for me. Be ready in season and out of season. I would say this is the idea of persevere. So preach the word. And the second would summarize this idea of being ready in season and out of season. Just persevere. Just keep doing that, Timothy. Just keep doing that, Grace Fellowship. That person in the cubicle. That person at the lunch table. Just consistently make much of Christ. Engage them. And when they don't want to listen, pray. Love them. Do good works for them. So that your light might shine before them. Because there's coming a point where... You don't feel like it, Timothy. I don't feel like it. You won't feel like it. Just persevere. When it is easy, when it is hard, when it is an embrace, when it is opposed, when it's convenient or inconvenient, rewarding or not rewarding, just tell the truth. Tell the truth about God, life, and relationships. And consistently do that because this is the hope this is the way you bring hope to people that are needy. So persevere. The third thing, what if people have wrong ideas about God and life and relationship? What if I'm engaging, I'm preaching the word and I'm persevering in that and all of a sudden I figure out that people, people have wrong ideas about who God is. Somebody thinks that God is this and other people think God is that and some people think well, I get to heaven this way and others I get to heaven that way. What do I do? The next, reprove or correct, or convict. It's the idea of correction through the scripture. This is listed in 2 Timothy 3.16, where it's talking about the, the nature of the scriptures, that uh, helping people understand. It's the idea of correcting. That somebody's kind of going this way, and you go, hey, I don't think you want to do that. Or you see somebody getting angry with someone unjustly, and go, hey, you need to calm down. We, we reprove 
in the hallways of our church. We were proven in the classrooms. We were proven here. We were proven in the parking lot. See somebody who's been coming for church, they're a follower of Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden they drift away. Whose responsibility is it to reprove them? Certainly the pastor, but absolutely you. Hey, call them up. Hey, what's going on? I'm concerned. That's correcting. That's reproving them. I miss seeing you here. What's going on? You're responsible to do that. I'm responsible to do that. That's part of the body of Christ. And again, we hit this two weeks ago. I've got to tell you this. Spending time with pastors in our county this week, and I, and I brought this up like the bull in the china shop where guys are talking about going online and trying to expand the online audience to get the message of the gospel out. And I said, well, how in the world can you do what a pastor is supposed to do if you never meet the person? If you're doing only online church, you're not a pastor. And that went over really big, by the way. <laughs> it's just because I just, you see that and go, you cannot functionally reprove. You cannot correct somebody if they live 3,000 miles away from you because you don't know their life and they don't know yours and they're not in part of things. You can't see things. And they can just shut you off whenever they want. There are times in which you absolutely have to be committed to the body of Christ because when someone ticks you off, you can walk down the road. But here's the thing. You need to be reproved and you need to learn and grow and develop. And if you can pull the ripcord too easy and just walk, you'll always be immature. God has put us in the lives of one another so that we can help mature one another. And that means correcting one another. That means reproving one another. What about if people don't like what you have to say? What if someone doesn't like this correction? What will you do at that point? Depending on the subject, if this is about the word, if this is about Christ, if this is about God, life, and relationships, and someone says, hey, I think this is who God is, and it's wrong according to the word. It's not who Christ is. Or if they want to live in a way in their life that is a denial of how God has made them. Or if they want to have a relationship that is wrong to have, an illicit relationship. And what if they don't want to be corrected? Well, then the next step. Rebuke. It's a verb in the New Testament that's used only one time in Jude 9 when the, arch, uh, the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. That's the only other time this word is used. In other words, this is a big deal. When you get to this point, it's not a question of whether or not somebody might be doing wrong. It's that they absolutely are. And there comes a point in which you go, I'm not rebuking you. This is not my perspective. We've established that this is what the Lord says. The Lord rebukes you because you're going against what he has said that is clearly articulated in the word. And remember, he's watching. He's the judge of the living and the dead. If you find yourself on the other side of what the Lord says for you to do in his word, whoa, watch out. That's hard truth. That's not easy. No one gets their kicks off of doing that stuff. At least no one here. But it's necessary. It's necessary. If you want to help people be healthy. And the final thing he says here, he says, exhort. That has the idea of, of encourage. It has the idea of put somebody on your, on your back and carry them at times. That could be in this order because after the rebuking, that stern measure, there's some type of discipline. And then the idea of exhort could be in juxtaposition of that. In other words, somebody goes, oh, you're right. But I'm weak. And I was wrong in what I did. Would you help me? And that's where I think he maybe he puts exhort here at the back end, the fifth imperative. It may be that you've got to carry somebody. Maybe you have to coach somebody specifically, gently, yet firmly, in what they need to do. You need to exhort people. I, I picture the last thing, scene of the Lord of the Rings. Remember the last installment of that in which Frodo is making his way to the volcano. And remember, who is it that carries Frodo? 
Samwise Gamgee. In other words, I can't carry the ring for you, but I can carry you. I think that's the idea. Pastors have to carry people. You'll have to carry friends in order for them to make it to where they need to go, in order for them to make much of Jesus Christ. Those are five things. That's one motivation. Hopefully you're motivated by the fact that God watches you as you strive to get the gospel out in your neighborhoods, with your family, with your coworkers. He's watching you. You're playing for an audience of one. In here, he watches us, encouraging us to get involved in the lives of one another, to do those five things, to move in in and out of those five principles. That's your, your job description. That's certainly my job description as a pastor. And if you want to do your job well, you've got to know what your job is. And now you know. As the band is coming forward, two things, takeaways. And I think these flow dramatically from the text. The first would be live with the end in mind. You know what you're supposed to do, so it's critical now that you do what you're supposed to do. You could say even, do your job. Live with the end in mind. It's true. 10 out of 10 people die. We won't always be here. Live with the end in mind. I find it fascinating that Paul is spending the last days of his life writing this guy, saying, remember this, do this, I encourage you in this way. He could, he could shrivel up and become bitter. How does my life end like this? So I thought I'd be more, I thought I'd be different. He doesn't. He's living with the end in mind. Same thing with you. When it comes to coworkers, family, friends, They're going to pass away. They're not going to be in the cubicle next to you. They're not going to be your neighbors. What are you doing? How are you extending who Christ is? For the people that you're sitting around now, live with the end in mind. Encourage that person. Exhort them. Reprove them. Possibly at points in time, rebuke them. Live with the end in mind. To do those things, you'll only do those things if you know the the sand in the hourglass is moving out. The second thing is obedience is the best way to care for a believer and rescue the lost. Obedience is the best way. Not our creativity, not our trickiness, not our marketing campaigns. Just obey. Just do, Timothy, what you're supposed to do. Grace fellowship. Let's just do what we're supposed to do. Preach the word. Persevere. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. Function in those five imperatives. And God will make much of himself in our midst because Christ will be championed. And I'll tell you, in this dark world, people want to know. Where can they go where people will tell the truth? Where people explain who God is? Where people aren't scared of questions about God? How does life work? How do relationships best function? The world chases after all sorts of stuff. That there'll be a person in your life, maybe a neighbor, maybe a coworker, maybe a family member, will get to a point in their life and they'll go, Is this what really life's about? And you're close enough that you can be the person that tells them about Christ. You preach the word. You care for them. And he is putting people in your life. Just pay attention. God's watching. Just be open. Be sensitive. Eyes open. Ears attentive. And we will be sure, if we do that, that we will spread the fame of God. We are so excited that you're with us in the journey for that. Can we pray together? Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the fact that so gracious to us. You've been so kind to us, rescuing us, that none of us were smart enough to choose you. You were kind and gracious to awaken us to our need. And those in this room who've never come to that point, would you do that now? Would you impress upon them the need that they have to trust in you? And would you help us as a church to function in these imperatives, to remember that you're watching, remember our motivation is for you, and thank you that we're not doing it to get your approval, but we are doing it because you have approved of us. 
You've accepted us. And then we don't do those things well. You lift us up. You remind us. You bring fresh repentance in our life. And thank you for that. May you continue to make this church, this people, um, may we continually impact this community and make much of you, Jesus, because you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, for which we are thankful for. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.